Hello, everyone. I'm Harpreet Singh, welcoming you to the Future of Work Pioneers podcast. Today, we are speaking with Jack Spendenbrook, who serves as the chairman of the executive board and the CEO at Ronstad. Jack is responsible for leading Ronstad's $25 billion global business with a mission of supporting people and organizations with solutions in the field of flexible work and HR services around 38 countries. Jack, welcome to the show. Yeah, thank you. Great to be here. So let's begin with your background. Uh, tell us uh, about any defining moments that uh, led you to this uh, career path. And, uh, you know, you, you have a very interesting career from a branch manager all the way up to uh, the chairman of a, of a major company. Uh, and I, I bet that perspective informs your decision making. Uh, and, and uh, you know, so you have a benefit that many people would not have. So I would love to kind of understand that entire journey. Okay. Well, the entire journey, I don't know how long we have, but uh, <laughs> it's 33 years. Um, but what is interesting, because, of course, uh, we talked a bit uh, before we started this interview of AI and, and technology. But then still, if I look at my early days in the branch, it's still about the human connection. Uh, and, and technology can do a lot of stuff, uh, can make it very accessible for people to know their possibilities in the marketplace. We talked about skilling. Uh, so, so that's all good stuff to have. But at the end of the day, it was always this click. And a defining moment for me was, yeah, coming in the first time in the branch and then just seeing the dynamism and, and you know, the context with people. And it's very result-based, right? So you immediately see your effect, positive or negative, on, on a person's life. And I really never looked back. Um, and I, I don't think I could be a CEO of just any company. I don't believe in the fact that you are generally equipped to be a CEO. At least that doesn't go for me. Because I know the business so well, I'm, I'm, I'm able to lead uh, to where we want to go, which is still an uncertain future, of course. Uh, and and it, we're innovating. We're doing new stuff. But yeah. And also last year, COVID, when you're in stress, as a company, as many companies and people were, um, and, well, I was very thankful for my experience uh, to, to lead uh, our company, uh, you know, and still at the end of the year came out well, at the better end of, uh, of the year. Yeah. So um, uh, as Ron Starr's uh, chief executive, uh, one of your important roles is uh, influencing the company's corporate culture. Um, so how does a leader go about doing that? And uh, what have been some of your learnings in that process? Yeah, well, I always say you don't talk about a culture. Uh, you just do what you do. Uh, and that sort of defines the culture. Uh, we are, in essence, still what I would say a family uh, company. So our founder, Fritz Goldsmading, is still alive, founded the company 60 years ago as, as an economics major. Um, and he instilled, you know, yeah, values. Values as in a company doesn't have the right to exi exist if they don't give to society, if they're not valuable in society. So that is not just doing, you know, stuff on the side, but in the core of what you do, be valuable to society. And we formulated our values to know, to serve, and to trust already in the beginning of the 1980s. Um, so then it was not, not very visible in the service industry uh, on what that all meant. Um, but by now, what's interesting to see, we have a relatively young workforce, mostly millennials, and they, they do like this purpose. They do like uh, to be relevant to society, relevant to people in their jobs. And, and again, uh, in COVID times, what we, you know, we were very valuable to society in uh, safely back to work, getting people back to work, in reskilling. So that, again, proved that this is a very worthwhile job. Um, yeah, and then as a, as a, how do you do culture? I think you need to be very visible as a leader. So, yeah, of course. Yeah. Well, I, I'm actually more visible than I was ever before uh, when I was still traveling in the old days. Remember those. Um, but uh, I still train, for example. So I still uh, train uh, international teams uh, from Randstad on sales. Uh, I still uh, participate in our uh, high executive program. Uh, I still hang out with, with people that started like uh, three years ago. And we have these recurring network events directly with consultants. And again, it speaks to my background. For me, it's easy, but 
we have 80% of promotion from within. And that's also very much geared at keeping the culture alive uh, because at the end of the day, we think that is what you know, sets us apart from other companies. Because the service, as you know, is invisible. It is the people that perform it, the way they perform it, that defines a culture, that defines a company. So, so tell us uh, uh, about uh, some of the values that you are trying to promote that are important to you. Yeah, well, our business uh, didn't out of the blue originate, right? So it starts in a country, uh, it started in the Netherlands in the 1960 for us, but it started in Italy in 1996. It started in China in 2012. So you always see this same uh, sort of coming alive of an industry with a legislative system. Uh, and then we're always uh, the first to form a sector body. Uh, we always want to have a collective labor agreement for temporary personnel, for contingent personnel. We're always face to face with trade unions because trade unions know uh, that flexible work, flexible workforce is necessity. A, com a company cannot survive by having everybody full time on their payroll. And by the way, many people don't even want that. Um, but then still, you know, the work needs to be well regulated, good pay. Uh, security, uh, even in some countries, uh, opportunities to get a mortgage, because as you know, many social systems hinge on the fixed job, uh, access to social security and that sort of thing. And that's what we try to, to, to change, really emancipating the flexible worker. Um, yeah, and we do that. Uh, we think that is part of what we do. We invest a lot of time uh, and people uh, to do that. Uh, and, and I think that's that, that, that shows. Uh, we have... Uh, uh, some 105 programs uh, throughout our 38 countries, either for uh, um, uh, unemployed youth, uh, handicapped youth, people with a distance to the labor market, very, um, you know, uh, targeted skilling. I was in Argentina and Buenos Aires uh, just before COVID hit uh, in, in, in a barrio, so, so an underprivileged neighborhood where people come in from all over South America and, and then our consultants train them and, and what we do, our training is always aimed at the job. We're not just a training institution for the hell of it. It's always geared at the demand in the labor market. And I think that is something we really need. Um, educational institutions of which you're a part, they, they, they are not yet fully geared to the labor market. Uh, the social governments, uh, public employment services, uh, universities, they are still too siloed and we need to run one agenda. Uh, to, you know, skill and equip the workforce for, well, with the tools of tomorrow, right? So you, you, you've uh, mentioned emancipation of uh, the, the contingent workers. Uh, and I, that, that's a major issue in a country like the U.S. where I know. there as much regulation around uh, healthcare and, uh, you know, providing yeah. benefits. So from your vantage point, because you have a perspective into multiple geographies, multiple countries. Uh, how, do you, how do you see that evolving? Well, um, there is a worrying trend, and that is the gig economy. Um, we do see many platforms uh, that say they're a platform, whatever that means. Uh, but basically, people work there uninsured. Uh, we've recently seen a lawsuit for Uber. We've seen one for Deliveroo. Uh, we think that... Um, the shift we need to go through is that, that, that the whole system hinges around the fixed job. It should hinge around work. So whenever you work in whatever capacity, uh, you should be able uh, well, to have decent pay, uh, to be insured if something happens to you, you fall ill, whatever, and you should have access to Social Security if uh, you're, you're, you're not uh, employed anymore for whatever reason. That doesn't mean you don't have a responsibility yourself. You're always, you're, at the end of the day, you're responsible for your own employability, for your own job. But then still, you need to be offered chances. And fortunately, certainly in Western Europe and the US, I'm not saying globally, but there is enough work. We're going to be short of people. But at the same time, there's many people working under what I would call uh, deplorable circumstances. And that's not necessary. And, as a cons and labor has a price, right? So... You cannot have in Europe someone working for 15 euro all in an hour. So that should be, at, let's say, 25 euro, including, well, and there's many forms of labor that don't uh, uh, provide that. And 
Yeah, I'm European, so maybe I'm a socialist. If you, if you, if you, if you go to the, the to, to, to the to the US uh, uh, sort of frame of mind, but for me, an inclusive workforce, and this is one of the sustainable goals, of course, we have as as a world, is that there should be an inclusive workforce. People can, if they work, can provide for the family. Uh, they their kids can have an education. They need to have decent living, and well, there's still a lot of work for all of us, I think. Diversity and inclusion, uh, these are important topics in the boardroom uh, across Fortune 500s. Uh, how do you think about diversity? Why do you think it's important? And are you noticing a shift in how companies are hiring talent? Well, early days, I think. Um, inclusion is not a nice to have. I think inclusion is necessary for two things. It's widely known that uh, uh, diverse teams perform better, diverse companies perform better than non-diverse companies. I must say, let me, let me, my experience, I used to be uh, in the board uh, with four middle-aged Dutch men. And well, that was easy. We always agreed. We always looked in the world in the same way. Now we are a team of six with six nationalities, uh, two women, four guys, living across the world. Um, and actually, as a CEO, that is hard work. <laughs> Harder work than with, with the four Dutch. But it's better. You get better decision-making. You get better vantage points. So that is a necessity. The second one is just uh, how the labor force uh, will evolve. You know, you cannot have just this one ideal profile because you need everybody uh, to be a mirror for your consumers, but also to have the right people at the right time. And that is, you know, uh, not an easy task. Um, and we talked about AI. I think AI can also help overcome biases. Eh? Some people say AI sort of magnifies biases, but I think it can also overcome when programmed well, when, when interpreted in the right way, it can overcome biases. We sometimes say to, to clients, give us your ideal profile. Who is going to be always successful in your culture, in your company? And then they give us a certain profile, but then we can see that if you really look at the successful people in the company, it's actually not true. So then you need to make a deliberate policy out of, hey, actually, that's not true. I'm, I'm personally very uh, proud um, that for the first time at Randstad, we have 51% uh, of our management being female. Um, and that takes time. That's a pipelining thing uh, that is accompanying, in this case, mostly women on their career path. Uh, and in the mid 30s, it, it becomes tough because then there's a family and, 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 and then as management, you need to adopt, in this case, uh, uh, talented uh, women. What we also see, by the way, last year in COVID is that the brunt of having to cope with the family and homeschooling goes to the, to the women. Uh, and, and, and we've seen some of our own staff under stress. I think that is as a, as a CEO, as a board member, as a whatever, someone running a company, be very aware of that. This episode is brought to you by Experfy. Incubated in Harvard Innovation Lab, Experfy provides custom future of work solutions, such as private talent clouds and skill taxonomies. Experfy differentiates itself by using subject matter experts to pre-vet and pipeline candidates for AI and high-end technology skills. However, Experfy Talent Cloud Platform is skill agnostic and can be licensed to build custom talent clouds for any and all skills. In a different use case, enterprises interested in employee intermobility can license the Experfy platform to create an internal gigs marketplace where interested employees can be algorithmically matched to projects, gamifying their learning experience. Visit www.expertify.com for more information. So the, uh, how, how did this happen, the, 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 that 51% of the management becomes women? Is there a, was it a concerted effort to make that happen? Uh, how yeah. did you achieve that? It's very admirable. Well, I think it always is, it's a mindset. Um, yeah, well, speaking for myself, it's very close to home. Uh, my wife is a, is a tax advisor. She was the first female partner in her firm. And they were just in existence for 80 years, 80. <laughs> so for me, it was very close to home. Um, and then, yeah, I, I had a working mom uh, always, which, you know, in the 60s, 70s was certainly in the Netherlands, not very logical. So for me, it comes natural. So that is the mindset. And the mindset is always the most important thing. And then you need to build a structure. And the structure is very much, as I mentioned earlier, pipelining. 
Honestly speaking, for us, pipelining is relatively easy because we start with 60% females. So we have sort of the, the, the material to work with. There's been many companies that only have 10 to 20% females. And it might be because you're uh, in a technical area and you know there's not a lot of female role modeling. Eh? It, 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 it starts to go wrong already in, in, in kindergarten where a fireman is always a, a guy and, and a doctor is always a guy, right? So we need to really work already there. But then in our company, it's, yeah, you know, um, I don't want, so, so a recent example, we had a, a high, high potential training. Uh, and so the group was lined up to go to the training and it was like 60% men. I said, I'm not going to take this. This is not the right group. So go back and give me another group of people. And then I got 60% females, which is logical given our pipeline. So you really need to push back all the time. It's not like my people are doing things wrong, but um, men always put themselves more easily forward where females was probably say, I'm ready for this. So they don't proactively put their candidacy forward. So I think you need to look harder. And this is just the gender diversity. Cultural diversity is, is even tougher. Mm -hmm. Thanks to the pandemic, uh, remote work has become ubiquitous and companies when hiring have made more choices, uh, or rather companies have more choices when they're hiring because uh, they can consider people in different geographies. So what do you think uh, happens after the pandemic? Uh, and what is your advice to companies as they are rethinking their office space? Yeah. Well, I think first you need to uh, look into your employer brand. Um, so what do you have to offer? That, is, that was already uh, pre-pandemic a thing um, because uh, the, the, the labor market was already tough and it, very quickly it will become tougher. And maybe we can talk about that one later, but the underlying scarcity of certain profiles, uh, we talked about technology earlier. So that's going to quickly come back. Um, working from home was an interesting thought uh, that I heard is that if you work from home, um, the ability to change jobs and employers is actually easier. There's this lower threshold. So you really need to reach out. And we talked about corporate culture, right? Get a corporate culture, different management style. Still quite a few managers who struggle with managing a remote workforce. Uh, I think you need to be very forthcoming uh, because, you know, the candidate is going to, to a certain extent, define how they want to work, where they want to work, and how they're going to work, and how much they're going to work. And as an employee, you need to be open to that. I said already pre-pandemic that if you run a company, your workforce is going to look like this. From an age point of view, from 18 until 70, 25% um, or 30% is going to work from home. And then 25 to 30% is not even working for you. They're performing jobs on your behalf. That is your workforce. And in that, you need to create a culture. Uh, you need to have a performance. You need to have motivation. You need to have purpose. And then people looked at me like, eh, that's not going to happen. But uh, eh, COVID is speeding up a lot of things among, among one, this working from home, which I think is great. It's great for uh, female and careers. It's great for pollution in the air, traffic. It's all good. I don't want to work 100% from home, but, eh, you know, 25 to 30%, I think that will be the future. And you need to accommodate it as an employer. Randstad joined uh, the Safe, Safely Back to Work Alliance, which is led by World Employment Confederation in making sure that return to work will be safe and effective while having a strong economic recovery. So tell us more about this alliance and how Randstad is contributing to it. Yeah, sure. Well, actually, we invented it. <laughs> um, a, 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 uh, someone in my network uh, who's a partner at McKinsey wrote an article uh, that said, can someone put on a light at the end of the tunnel? Because in the early days uh, of COVID, it was all about healthcare. And we knew the economy was going to be badly hurt. But yeah, uh, we chose the healthcare crisis. But then quickly, you know, we knew that there was a price to be paid, which was called the economy. And we also know that if people get unemployed, they get sicker easy. And there's all sorts of, you know, long-term uh, disadvantages. So he said to me, you know, could we do something? And, and then I said, well, we have lots of health and safety experts. We had clients in life sciences in essential services that just continued to work. So in the beginning, there were in a way too many people home 
Uh, and, and logical, uh, don't get me wrong, because of the immediate danger. But then we said, let's see how we can get people quick back, quickly back. So I called uh, uh, Jonas Prising from Manpower and Alain de Hazel from Madeco. I said, you know, guys, should we lead this? So we started with the three of us, built the alliance. Um, and we thought we were going to work in 10 markets, but it quickly turned out to be 26 markets. Um, what we did was we looked at all the health and safety protocols uh, that were there for all the industries that you can think of. But that is very much an 80-20 thing um, with some specifics all the time for a certain sector. So we devised a model protocol, created a website where a company could really have a checklist. And we worked in these 26 markets with governments, trade unions, employers uh, to build and update all the protocols in light of COVID. And then because it became so widely spread, the WEC, uh, our sector body, took over, which is good and logical. So now the whole industry is participating. The industry is the biggest employer in the world. We, we In 2019, uh, we put 58 million people to work with the likes of, you know, we are the top three, but we just have like 15% market share combined. So I think we're very happy as the industry that we could uh, um, contribute to having all these people back to work. What you also hear a lot is that flexible people lose their work quicker. Well, actually, we now have more people back to work in December 2020 than people that lost their job uh, in March. So in March at Runstad, 150,000 people lost their job. At the end of 2020, we had some close to 170 people back to work again, and we took care of them. So yeah, we stayed in contact, we, we provide them all sorts of uh, education, training to get maybe to a different job if your sector was totally down, like airlines or events or hospitality. So, uh, yeah, very worthwhile for us as an industry, back to our culture again. You want to participate, you want to contribute. Looking across uh, the geographies that you serve, uh, wh what is the economic outlook uh, in this recovery? Uh, you, you, you talked about... Uh, that people are getting back to work, but are you finding that certain geographies are doing better than others? And also perhaps certain professions uh, or industries are doing better than others? Yeah. Yeah. So when, 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 when we started in, in, with COVID, I modeled uh, the drop very much to 2009 and the financial crisis. But it turned out to be totally different because in the financial crisis, nothing was moving. Because nobody could finance his business, so the whole value chain broke down. Banks didn't finance anymore. This was different. So yeah, you had sectors that were totally down. Eh? Uh, airlines, uh, airports, anything around those areas. Uh, hospitality, small retail, small restaurants, quickly down. Absolutely. But there were also yeah, winning sectors. Eh? Supermarkets, food retail, uh, anything around e-commerce. Um, healthcare, if you could would call that a, a, a winner, but there was demand, uh, education, um, uh, everything around vaccinating and testing. So we quickly pivoted a lot of people, even they kept their original employment contract. So they were working for an airline and then we uh, just educated them to become a tester on COVID. Uh, and you might come back to your, your different job. Uh, but uh, so those are um, the winning sectors, so to say. But I mentioned earlier that COVID uh, makes different people lose their job than the future of work will, so to say. Because COVID, it was really about mostly blue collar jobs related to certain sectors, but those sectors will bounce back. Once we vaccinated everybody, the restaurants will open, people will travel again, and people will be back in those jobs. But the real jobs in danger are the white collar jobs. So if you are now in a job, you're in your early 40s uh, doing something administrative, you will not uh, do that job until you're retired. So this is in banks. We already see it. It's in insurance companies. It's in governments. So you need to prepare. You need to look differently at your skills to see what is marketable and where you need to go to. And that is, for me, that's the big, how do you call it? Big question mark. On the one hand, we're going to be short of people. So we have all sorts of studies showing that we're going to be short people, the demographics and what have you. But at the same time, uh, there are going to be people that can do those jobs through training that are going to be stuck and don't want to move because it's scary uh, out of their white collar job. And that is certainly in, in, in Europe, 
we're going to invest. So I think governments did a good job to support people. We need to have an aggressive investment agenda on digital infrastructure, physical and digital infrastructure, uh, on climate, a lot of demand. And then we can't fill those jobs. So we can't have the growth and we can't find climate change. And we're going to have potential high unemployment. So, and the system we have with public employment agencies and that sort of thing, with education being still a bit siloed towards what the labor market really demands, we need to have this integrated plan to work together. A bit like the Safely Back to Work Alliance. It worked there. Let's do that again on matching supply and demand on the midterm, let's say midterm, two to three years and beyond in the labor market. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, bleak picture. Yes, no, absolutely. I think that's an important question that is on the minds of many uh, uh, policymakers as well. So, so how do you propose? Uh, this is this is an interesting suggestion you have that you know bring people together uh, to rethink this. So, what what do you think goes into that kind of a consortium? What what do you, you yeah. know, who, who do you need to have on the table, and how do you make this work? Yeah, let me paint a picture. Um, so first you make a macro picture. You say, okay, what does our total workforce look like? So what we need to do is like we do in our uh, digital outplacement business. You make a profile out of every working person or non-working person in the labor market. First of all, that's interesting for the individual people because they can talk to their employer, uh, what their, what's their future in their current employment. So that's the workforce. Then you make a picture of the demand. Some sectors are fairly easy. Healthcare, uh, 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 education, those are numbers games. You know how many students that's gonna be. Uh, so you know how many teachers and how many, uh, uh, you know how many people on average are sick, uh, demographics. So you know that, you can map that out. Then there are certain sectors which are gonna be in demand. Well, you're a professor in AI, Um, What I always say is there's a few things that AI cannot replace, and those are typical human being things. That is dexterity, something with your hands, eh? so order picking, eh, for example, something with your head on all sorts of levels, and something with your personality, again, on all sorts of levels. So these jobs you can map out also towards educational levels. There are a lot of new jobs which are not complicated, but might be nice jobs. So, for example, content tagging. There's going to be a huge market. We're not going to allow as a society what currently goes on to social media. We need to cleanse all that. Well, that tagging is a job. That's a job of the future. There's going to be increasing jobs around people, uh, taking care of children, taking care of the house, all sorts of those kind of service-like jobs. Uh, And then, well, we mentioned logistics. We mentioned e-commerce. So that's the mapping out. And then you got the people and their capabilities and you got the demand. So that's your macro picture. That sort of defines an educational agenda. And then you need to go down. And you can say a lifelong learning, but actually, and it's politically not so correct, but people don't like to uh, be educated lifelong. We reached out recently to 13, one, 3,000 of our people in the Netherlands who were currently not working because of COVID. And we each and everyone individually offered them dedicated training to move to a different sector. Less than a thousand picked us up. And this education was free. So that means that it is, you can say, well, we're in need of 2000 people there and we have 2000 people here. But at the end of the day, those are 2000 individual people that you need to take by the hand. That's doable, but then we need to reconfigure the public private partnerships. So call it the public employment agencies, the likes of us, HR people at companies, They all need to become these case managers, if you will, to make the change. There's enough money to go around. If you talk about the money that goes into social security, the money that goes into skilling, there's absolutely enough to go around, but we need to change the system. Mm -hmm. And that is tough. I'm I'm very involved in that. Goes back to our culture again. Everybody knows the diagnosis, but now what? Yes, I think I think uh, you, you're right. Uh, a lot needs to be done there, and uh, and these these are wonderful ideas of how, how to get started on on that journey. You you've talked about um, uh, upskilling, reskilling. Uh, so so tell us um, how is Randstad 
putting that into practice in a, in a practical sense? Yeah. Yeah. So we uh, scaled around 300,000 people in 2019. Um, so what we do uh, mostly, you know, there's a company, there's a client. Uh, and what we do with large companies is we go in and we say to them, let's first look at your own workforce. What will they look like three to five years from now? Who is going to be excellent with you, need to do nothing, key personnel? Who might still be there, but you got a training requirement. And who do you need, but you don't have them today, and how can you get them? And let's mirror that to your contingent workforce. Because it might be that you run the risk of having essential qualities that you hire from the outside, which might be risky. But at the same time, you might have a workforce which is totally unequipped, unequipped for you, but even worse, for the labor market. And that's a big change that we need to go through. Uh, companies need to uh, change from equipping and training people for their own process to equipping and training people for the total workforce. That also makes, you know, saying goodbye to people way easier because they're equipped to the external world. And that is what we do. So we help our clients to map out their workforce. We then make the mirror of what they have externally. And then we say, how can we together find the optimal way to organize work? And also uh, just to put work on a platform. It doesn't have to be, you know, performed by someone on your premises. You can just put it out there. Someone will take care of it. That change is going slowly. We still see a bit too much traditional way, you know, well, the department is being automated. Yeah, then we have a social plan. Then we lay off people. That is too late. It's traumatic. At the same time, companies say, yeah, it is also a bit of a tough message to say to all my staff that, I'm not sure they're going to be working for me the rest of their life. I said, well, that is factually true. So why not look eh, the animal in the eye? Because you're taking better care of people by having this discussion proactively. And again, you're going to be short of people. So the perspective for anybody working is actually good. Take the risk. You're a better employer. That's where we help. We are basically a data factory. So we know demand, uh, we know supply, and we can bridge that. We're not a training company. We decided to not become a training company. There's a lot of training out there. So we work with partnerships. We think our ability is to know the company, know the people, have the data and yeah, create a program basically. So that's what we do. And I definitely think there's going to be way more of that in the coming years. So you've alluded to this already uh, that advancements in AI and big data are, are reshaping industries. And we find that some employers have a much easier time um, hiring that kind of talent. Uh, but but vast majority of uh, Fortune 500s and large companies are, are struggling. Uh, so, so how do these um, organizations prepare for this new future, uh, especially given this talent is scarce? Well, um, I still think that AI is... Uh, on, the, on the point of the hype cycle where everybody talks about it, but, but the practical you know, tools are not yet there. So don't get too nervous. I think as a company also, you need to find out uh, if you need these people yourself or how is through the possibilities of AI, and it will definitely happen, how is it going to change your business model? Um, and then you can train your people towards it. Uh, and, and the quicker you are about this, the more of an exciting story you're going to tell as a company, yeah, the easier you get people in this case who are data scientists or, or are trained in AI. Because we, what we do is we measure the motivation for people to choose a certain job. And in IT, engineering and data science, it's the project. So people you know, go for the project. They don't go for the job of a lifetime. They go for the project. So as an employer... And you need to really define, do I need these people? Why do I need these people? And how you know, sexy of a job can I make out of it? And, and, and then at the end of the day, you, you, you can, you can uh, find the right people. At the same time, you need to make a choice or make or buy. So we work with big tech. We work with small tech uh, to get ourselves on the journey. We do have our own AI specialist, probably around uh, two 300 at, at the moment. But I got way more working for me because it's also, yeah, there are also projects, right? So, so we scale up and down with that workforce. We sort of drink our own medicine, if you will. Let's talk about um, contingent workforce models. Uh, we, there is a lot of uh, discussion around direct sourcing lately. Uh, and uh, then there may be others that you, you may be looking at. Uh, 
can, can, can you talk about what, what's happening in the industry more broadly at a macro level and uh, what, are, what, what are things that you find interesting yourself? Yeah, so what we've seen after every crisis, and of course this has been one, uh, is that uh, the penetration of contingent workforce rises. Uh, companies have seen that they were not agile enough uh, so they, they, they start to rebuild their contingent uh, workforce first. Uh, there's the big, the better companies, uh, they, they, they treat everybody the same. Uh, so their contingent workforce should be part of their culture, should be part of their, uh, their step payment systems and any secondary benefits you have. We get a lot of questions that the better uh, corporates want to act in that way. I think that's crucial. We still see uh, in many countries to uh a lot of badly regulated work. Uh, I mentioned earlier the platforms. Uh, you should not tolerate that. And as a responsible employer, definitely not. But also as a as a as a consumer, uh, you know, getting your meal delivered, uh, getting your uh, your e-commerce stock. Where is it coming from? Are these people well paid? That is still not not an emotion that people have. But I think it's crucial. Um, so. Yeah, we do, th- we do see quite some uh, uh, positive levers, so to say, for our, our industry um, to, to have legislation that is in favor of low thresholds to enter into the labor market. So our sector has always been a stepping stone and it's going to be increasingly so because there's going to be this mismatch, right? So I always say we provide you with the people that you never thought of. They are way beyond your ideal profile. But you're still happy because if everybody can, you know, find the right profile, then maybe we wouldn't even have a job. So that's going to be increasingly the case. Um, so, yeah, we're actually looking on the short term very optimistically. Uh, we think if everybody's vaccinated, we're going to have this consumer boom and whatever in the second half of the year. And people are going to be, you know, uh, getting contingent labor. Now, at the same time, I also think that young people. Uh, are not looking for the fixed job anymore. They're looking for an interesting lifestyle, maybe a combination of two or three jobs with an education, uh, more time for social uh, social uh, encounters and that sort of thing. So that's also a change that the labor market and employers need to embrace. Any any parting words for our audience? Um, well, maybe as I, I thought about this, um, but... Let me give the same parting words that I've given to my own staff now for six months is don't watch too many news programs. Don't watch too many news shows or newspapers because you get very pessimistic. It's all about the virus, all about a lost generation. It's all about what cannot be done. We see in our business all the possibilities. We see a lot of work, but yeah, you need to change. You need to go for it. So have an optimistic mindset. Uh, don't get derailed too much. Be optimistic. That's uh, That would be my parting words. That's wonderful. Well, thank you, Jack. It's been such a pleasure having you on the show. Yeah, same here. Great meeting you. Bye-bye.